It's an honor for me to introduce Dr. Jeffrey Cohen. His bio is in your program, so I'm not going to read it. It captures his stellar professional accomplishments. Each year I choose a white coat speaker who epitomizes the highest ideals of our profession and who has demonstrated extraordinary professionalism. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Cohen. So at the outset, to the parents, uh, I also have a first year medical student sitting here today. Uh, I'm sure he showers, but he doesn't answer his phone. <laughs> to the class, you look out and you see these bright shining faces. It's very impressive. So thank you, Dean Raboli, for the uh, privilege of addressing the class of 2023. I'm flattered to be here and to have a few minutes to tell you stories that might impact your careers. It's a tall order and presumptuous concept given the number of lectures you're about to receive over the next four years. And you question whether or not you're going to remember anything that I might say, but I do remember the first lecture I had in medical school where someone got up and talked about, welcome to the temple, and we're going to teach you how to pull the lever to get the smoke to come out of the idol's nose. I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, much has changed, and it's now 40 years since uh, I left uh, the State University of New York at Syracuse for my medical training. And I'm privileged and saddened to be here today because the reason I'm here is the events that unfolded on October 27th. And I'm here to talk to you about the role of the medical community and how it responded to that tragedy. As I do this, uh, the 11 people that were massacred at that day it was a beautiful Saturday morning. I think it's important that you know a little bit about my background to understand the points I'd like to make to you. October 27th is one of those days that I will never forget. There's days in your life that you know exactly where you were when things happened for your parents when Kennedy was assassinated, the Challenger, uh, shuttle blowing up, 9-11. These are days and for me also, September 21, I'm sorry, June 21, 1998, is when Aher filed for bankruptcy in the Philadelphia area, and some of you actually remember that. So you're about to begin a journey in medicine, uh, and let me describe for you what mine was like. And as I do that, before we start, look to your right and look to your left. These are leaders. You may not recognize them as such, but they are leaders, as will be you and your leaders because of what you've chosen to do. So how did I get here? Uh, I grew up in a small town in upstate New York, and uh, my dad was a lawyer, a very powerful Republican in New York, and he wanted me to come back to this small town and be a lawyer. I grew up being cross-examined by my father at the dinner table every night. I did not like the fact that he took my writings in middle school and high school and ripped them apart, so I came home one day and said, I'm going to be a doctor. He didn't particularly care for that, and he called up a lady who was the uh, administrator of the small hospital in Port Jervis, New York, Sister Mary Jean Ferrier. The conversation went something along the lines of, Sister, my oldest son has decided that he wants to go into medicine, and before we waste a seat on him in uh, medical school, I'd like to make sure he has the right stuff. Sister then said, yes, Jerry, I understand, and the fix was in. I show up the first day as an orderly at the ripe age of 17, and I look like the good humor man being dressed in an orderly smock, the white shoes, the whole bit. They take me to the second floor. The head nurse takes one look at me. She rolls her eyes in disgust and said, go with the male nurse. He's going to teach you how to give a bed bath. What they had set up in advance was uh, they take me into a room, and the gentleman in that room was about to pass away. I had no idea of any of this. I walk in. Paul Breslin says to me, Jeff, we're going to teach you what you need to know to be able to be an orderly here. Okay. This is how you give a bed bath. The patient was not responding, he wasn't saying anything, and he was breathing rather heavily. He says, when you want to wash the feet, you do this. We go through all this. He says, Jeff, why don't you roll him towards you? So when you want to do someone's back, you put one hand on the shoulder, one of the hips, you roll him towards you. Why don't you roll him towards you, and I'll wash his back. I rolled the patient to me, and he died. First patient I touched, I had uh, killed at that point. 
It was a Catholic hospital. You learn that the toe tag goes on the right great toe. It points out, black ink, not blue, print, don't write. We put him in a shroud. We took him to a morgue. I did not know what a morgue was at that point. I came back. I pulled, uh, put in a Foley catheter, and I cleaned out a fecal impaction, and this was all before coffee at 10 o'clock in the morning. Sister comes down to coffee, the only time in four summers that I was there, and she looks at me and says, how are you doing, son? I said, uh, I'm okay. She goes, well, what do you think? I said, it's okay, sister. At this point, she goes back to her office. She sits down. She picks up the phone. She calls my father and says, Jerry, I've got sad news for you. He's going to be a doctor. <laughs> now, I was the son that she never had, and what sister wanted to do was impart her sense of morality on me of what a doctor's responsibility was. You can see... <clears throat> Excuse me. You can see that I have fairly good communication skills, um, and my mouth always worked much faster than my brain. She would take the, every opportunity that I opened my mouth and did something dumb to teach me. Being Jewish, I was not schooled formally in the words, yes, sister, no, sister, forgive me, sister, but I learned them at her hand. One episode when I was in the emergency room, I got into a discussion with an ambulance crew, um, which almost came to fisticuffs. They pulled us apart. I was probably 20 years old. The phone rings. The nurse says, sister is on the phone. She'd like to see you in the office. And you knew you were in trouble. The point of the story is I go to her office. This chair was cut off. You're looking at her. She was five foot nothing. She had a short habit. And when she was mad, she had masseters, which you will find out what those are, made her look like a python. She hovered over me and she said, Jeffrey, tell me what happened. I got three sentences into it. She holds up her hand. She goes, stop. What did you accomplish? Sheepishly, I looked back at her and I said, nothing. She goes, Jeffrey, the good Lord did a fantastic thing for you. He gave you a marvelous brain. Do you think you could use it before you open your mouth next time? And the answer is that it stayed with me my entire life. And what she imparted upon me was the sense that you should really listen. And through all these experiences, she was very, you know, gingerly, shall we say, teaching me what it was like to be a physician, how you had to reach out to people. And it wasn't about you, it was about them. Sister came to my wedding in 1985 at Tree of Life Synagogue. So being a synagogue, and I met my wife as a resident, um, she couldn't decide which rabbi, so we had two. And people would come in, and it was a small affair for 300. They would come into the room, and they would see two rabbis and a nun. It was sound at the beginning of a bad joke. <laughs> Sister worked the room like a pro, and she goes, isn't this wonderful? That's my boy up there. And indeed, I was her boy. And she took great pains to make sure that I was okay. She'd reach out to me. The other part of the story was that Sister Mary Jean was the head of the Catholic health system. And she literally controlled the Catholic hospitals from the Mississippi to the East Coast of the United States, one of which was in Pittsburgh. And she would frequently come out to check on Mercy Hospital in Pittsburgh, and she'd call me up and say, how you doing, son? The entire time, she reached out to me. And through her actions, you start to learn that your future is you'll be reaching out to other people. So the essence of this was not lost on me on October 27th. And I'd like to read to you a memo I wrote to myself the morning of October 28th. I've received many messages, emails, and phone calls from people checking on me and my family for the last 24 hours. Thank you for your thoughts and prayers and inquiries. We are fine physically, but shaken by what transpired. Best to tell you what happened and then provide some context. I was working in my study Saturday morning with my daughter and we heard a series of noises. My oldest, Paige, asked me uh, what were these noises and I replied, replied, something must have fallen off of the wall downstairs. A few minutes later, she noted a lot of police cars in the street in front of our house on Wilkins Avenue. We live about 100 yards from the front door of Tree of Life. Honestly, we moved there 25 years ago so as not to have to do carpool for Hebrew school. My kids caught the bus to school in front of the Tree of Life. This is our home. Shortly after that, she yelled at me to come downstairs, now. The immediate information that we got was that there was a shooting at Tree of Life. 
My wife Ellen was in tears as her mother is usually attends Saturday morning services. We found her at home. She slept in that day and she was relieved. As I went outside, a policeman was walking down the already cordoned off street. He yelled at me to get inside as it was an active shooter at the tree. As I watched him walk down the middle of the street, I heard the same noises that I heard in my study just before. This time, it was a lot of pops, which were gunshots, and there was no mistaking it. I witnessed six police officers run towards the tree and huddle behind the brick pillars. And this is, these brick pillars are where I would take my sons to get bus to school. They were trying to approach the tree with handguns and assault rifles. They didn't back down. They kept moving forward towards it. I went back inside to make sure Ellen and Paige were okay and came back outside 10 minutes later. The news was starting to break about the shooting. An EMS supervisor had pulled into our driveway. I went out and stood with him. If I could be of help to someone, I thought it was important to do so. We stood together watching the events unfold while listening to the radio as to what was transpiring. I watched a small army of SWAT officers assemble during this, Paul Porter, who was the director of the emergency room in Allegheny and Duke, my COO, called and texted me to make sure we were okay. I knew a citywide mass casualty event had been initiated from the EMS radio and thought it best to send information to Paul and Duke as to what was going on, so as to be prepared. Initially, four dead, 11 wounded. This changed quickly for the worse. I realized what the top popping noise had created. My phone was blowing up from others checking on us that know where we live. I tried to answer as many as I could. I kept Paul informed as to the situation and at the same time let him know that Mercy and Presby were getting the injured police. My hospital, Allegheny General, was getting the shooter as well as the extent of his injuries. Truth was, there was not a lot for me to do. The situation started to stabilize, and after about two hours, the SWAT team started to move back from the tree. They were gray, somber, and shaken. Not a lot of idle chatter indicating this was really bad. The assembled world was around the corner, and at times we were watching the world watch us on CNN. They were doing a real-time broadcast from the corner of Wilkins and Murray on the other corner across the house. The background was the hill in front of her house. I commented to my wife as we watched this, her hostas looked pretty good. She was flattered. As the situation started to unwind, I went and talked with a few people. I saw our mayor, Bill Peduto, standing across from the tree. I told him the incredible bravery of the people, the police, the, SWA, uh, the EMS people, the policeman who was walking down the street yelling for us to get in the house. In retrospect, the police were told not to approach the Tree of Life without a vehicle between them and the synagogue, and they didn't wait. They, they rushed in, they didn't know how many shooters there were. They were trying to help people. And mind you, most of them had never been to Tree of Life. These were just people responding. I commented to the, the mayor that we're better than this. Same words that Paul Porter told me as he was checking me on me earlier in the day. I was proud of the a AGH team who organized, assembled, and treated the shooter. The texts were coming from everywhere, and they said the people in the hospital were called in for this mass casualty event, and they all said, we're here to help. As the shooter got off the uh, ambulance coming into uh, AGH, he was yelling, we have to kill all the Jews. The first two people that treated him, one was a nurse, he's the son of a rabbi, and the other one is a Jewish emergency room physician. At no time did they ever identify by the religions. They were a doctor and a nurse, and they were there to take care of a patient, not a shooter. The entire time he was at Allegheny, he was treated as a patient. There were many people that had very strong feelings about this gentleman, but in our hospital, he was a patient. What struck me was that there were white, black, Muslim, Christian, brown, atheist, Democrats, and Republicans they all came together for the right reasons, were checking on me and my family. I received notes from friends and colleagues. They wanted to make sure that we were okay. What a day. Messages from overseas, around the country, and across the street. 
There's more, but this basically tells a story. I have to admit, I broke down afterwards thinking about what happened. I can't tell you why it happened. However, I come back to some thoughts to put it in perspective. I'm not very religious, but I do have a lot of faith, and when I go to a synagogue, I'm usually bored within five minutes, so I pick up anything I can to read. So what's sitting there is the Old Testament. First verse, Genesis, light and dark. God made light to separate the light from the dark. And to me, it was always a metaphor for good and evil, light and dark, chaos and order. And I thought about the darkness of the day. 11 people were executed for no other reason than they were there to pray. The shooter confused them with a threat. The youngest person in there was a handicapped 55-year-old, and most of them were at least 65. The oldest was 97, Rose Malinger. They were executed, and those pops I heard was him going and just shooting them in a pew. The light was the response of the community, and one of the foundational parts of the community is what you're about to get into was healthcare. The reason it's foundational is that we don't judge. We're there to help. And as Sister Mary Jean looked at me and many times was very stern in her admonitions about something dumb I had done, what she taught me was that you're going to be trusted to do the right thing. Don't screw it up. The world came to my hospital to see a shooter, the people in that hospital the people that you're going to emulate as you put on your white coat were there because they trusted them at the worst time in their lives. They came to a hospital and were taken care of by doctors and nurses who stood up and said, we will honor the ethics of our profession. The reason that white coat is important is that those that came before you made a difference. Patients and families will come to you with horrible problems. They're the most personal problems in their lives and they will trust you because of the people that come before you. And you're part of a long line of people that have said, I'm here to help. And one of the fundamental things that's different about what you're going into is that in medicine, it's what can I do for you? In the rest of the world, it's primarily what can I do for me? And that's what makes you different. So these fine people went through six to 7,000 applications. All of them said the same thing. I like science and I wanna help people, right? That's how you got in. How many of you worked in hospitals just to prove you like medicine? Yeah, we got one honest person over here. <laughs> what you're gonna find out is that 40 years later, that's why they chose you, because they saw something in your background, in your application, and identified you as somebody that likes science and really wants to help people. And in helping people, whether you realize it or not, the person on your left, and the person on the right, and you, are leaders of the world around you. None of us can sit here today and tell you what the future is gonna hold any more than people 40 years ago could look at me and say, this is what your future holds. We don't know. You will have challenges and you will have opportunities. You will have bad days and you will have good days. But as you put on your white coat, much is expected of you. Because the good Lord looked down on you and blessed you all with fantastic brains. So please, use them before you open your mouth. So as I conclude, I get, there's, there's several things that I've learned on my journey. One is trust. Trust is the fundamental difference which makes you different than the rest of the world. They trust you to help them. So you've been selected because of that. And it's a privilege every time you sit and talk with someone. Compassion. You've all demonstrated that in one form or another. Walk in the other guy's shoes. Why did he do this? I had the opportunity very briefly to talk to the shooter and what I could not wrap my head about was why did he do this? And to this day I have ideas but I don't know why he did this. I had the opportunity to talk to the pastor for the Mother Emanuel Church and that was one of the other things that I was astounded by. As Dylan Reed went in and prayed with nine con congregants for the Mother Emanuel Church 
And after an hour, he got up and executed them. At the end of the trial, they stood up and said, we forgive you. I thought that was amazing. How can you forgive somebody that just executed your mother, your brother, that sat there? And the answer was, there is no other choice. That is the essence of compassion. Curiosity. Why? You're going to be taught, you're going to, be taught to be part of a process. That there is a right answer. That it's a cookbook. It's not. Always ask the question, why? How can you do this better? Hope and despair I've talked about is the light in the dark. Good leaders act more than they talk. It's one thing to say a lot of stuff or Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, and it's another thing to just go out and do it. Your actions speak much louder than your words. So with all this, you will recall that on September 20th of 2019, you began a journey. And CMSRU class of 23, 2023, your white coats are the beginning of that journey, which will last you the rest of your life. The journey tra defines you as a trusted confidant who's smart and compassionate. You will all be leaders at some point in your careers. You'll know when it happens as you help someone because they trusted you to do the right thing. That's the essence of the path that you're looking out at. And as I sat here with uh, President Hushman, I marvel at the faces, how bright, you know, you all dressed, you took showers, ties. I got rid of my tie a long time ago. This was in a closet. I know the future's in good hands. So on behalf of myself, my family, my community, I wish you the well. Godspeed. <laughs>